Hey, what's up, fellas? This is Dr. Gandhi. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of What's Your Story? Here, essentially, I want to talk to fellow Indians who have gone through an awakening, who have realized the truth, who have understood that there is something, you know, that, they are, that the perspective that they have been living their life out of is just one out of the many perspectives and many possibilities. And they have stepped out of this conditioning um, that they were in previously, and they're uh, living a greater and more abundant life, hopefully. Um, so love and abundance to all. And today I'd like to welcome our guest, Parth Savla. Parth, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Varun. Thank you so much again for having me on your show. And it's, it's really an honor. And um, thank you for all of you who are tuning in and, and for giving me the opportunity to share my, my journey. Yeah, Parth. So Parth and I met through the Jain, which is my religion, the Jainism, Jain community. And we kind of, from our first conversation, we just aligned. And I think it was might have been a post that we did on Facebook or might, I, might, I might have posted something on Facebook and we connected. And, you know, our conversations have been all very transformational since then. It's all been very aligned in the same direction. So I... That's why I thought Barth would have, would be perfect for this, you know, what's your story and how he has gone through his awakening process uh, and maybe the many awakening processes that you have gone through over the, because I know your journey has been much longer. It's been, um, well, like, since you were in the teens or something when you started, you know, going through your awakening process. Correct. Yeah. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about it? Like, what... You know, what were some of the, the mindsets and mentalities and you had before? Yeah, sure. So actually, it was really interesting. I grew up, I'll give you a little bit of background. Yeah. I apologize for the background. Um, I grew up actually learning a lot about Indian philosophy and culture. So I'd gone to the Sunday school every Sunday in New Jersey uh, called Vivekananda Vidyapri to learn about mm. Vedas and Upanishads. And it was based on Swami Vivekananda's teachings and Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, right? Wow. So. So growing up from the age of six to about 15 every Sunday there, um, I always had this longing for, like, who am I? You know, why, like, why am I here? What's my purpose? Um, you know, we read so much about we came here before this life and all of these things. So, you know, what, what's the thing that's going to give my life a lot of meaning? Right. And so, um, you know, I'll share with you kind of two turning points. One was... Okay, I'll share with you a vision. And this is actually the first time that I'm putting this all out there um, for everyone to, to, to kind of hear. Um, and I feel like this is a collective vision, but this might take me about 60 seconds, about 90 seconds to share here with you. But, um, but so in this vision, since I've had since I was a teen, um, and typically visions happen between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. You know, usually if we go to bed at a normal time, things get activated in our subconscious minds, right? And so this vision is, um, so here I am probably in my late 50s or so, um, maybe early 60s, and I'm here on the, in the run of Kutch. Okay. Right? It's probably 10.30 a.m. It's a beautiful Saturday morning. There's all these tents being put together. There must be some mela going on, some um, celebration. And my ancestors are from the run of Kutch. And so I'm asking this um, older gentleman, who is Kachi, you know, this old gentleman, he's got this big beard, red beard, gray beard, sullen eyes. And I'm asking him, Kachi, like, what's going on here? You know, and he says, well, they're celebrating. And I said, well, what work are they celebrating? They're, and he said, well, they're celebrating the work that's been done on this planet. And I said, well, what do you mean? And so he said, look over there. So he points to this building several hundred feet behind me. And it's in a pentagonal shape. It's got solar panels and there are these students that are going in and out. It must be the turn of in between classes. And he says, because of their work, my great granddaughter is learning to be a healer on this planet. And I said, what do you mean? She says, she's learning to heal these deep wounds. She's been studying with the Native Americans in the last year. And she's going to be studying with the Aborigines in the next six months. And she's only 16. She's learning to heal these deep wounds of this planet. Mind-blowing, right? So, wow, this is pretty wild. Wow. And so, well, well, who are these people that are gathering and where are they gathering? So he points behind him into this tall building, probably about 21 floors. The 21st floor is three walls of glass. 
And he said, that's where they're meeting. And I said, really? And he said, one of our boys um, is part of it. And I said, who? And so he says, part Sava, right? Mm-hmm. So now I'm here on this 21st floor, almost done with this, right? Um, this is kind of where the juice is. And I feel like we're all part of this collective vision holding. I'm on the 21st floor and there's this huge table. I'm probably in this like white narrow suit with like red embroidery. And I could tell you, Varun and everyone, like the visions, get, they just, it just gets crisper and crisper the more that I'm aligning what I'm doing in life with my purpose, with my highest self. And I feel like that's true for all of us. Mm-hmm. So, so here I am in this beautiful Chiku table and there's two elements on the wall, on the solid wall, right? So there's four satellite screens digital screens, four on the top, four on the bottom. And next to it is a world map. And on this map, there are two elements. One is push pins, right? And second are strands that connect these push pins. So what are push pins? So these push pins end up being institutions of unlearning or re, reconnecting or remembering uh, terminology, right? And the push pins are, there's about 12 or 13 of these on the world map. And the push pins are three different colors, green, yellow, and red. So green means that they're, totally integrated with the building materials of that area. They're integrated with the people who live locally. They're also integrated with at the deity level or at the unmanifest level, guardians are talking to other guardians. There's a harmony there, right? Um, And so that's green, that's thriving. Yellow is it's up and coming, there's still work to be done. And red is, you know, there's resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of like almost a good thing because that means it's calling us to drop a little bit deeper to connect deeper with like what consciousness is arising on this planet, right? And then there are these threads. So the threads are again, green, yellow, and red. So green is a sharing of resources. Students are going from one place to another and they can stay locally or travel. Same with teachers. Um, And then also flow of resources, money and other things, Mm -hmm. right? And so, sorry? That's positive flow total positive flow and what's really wild is is that there's this like global network where people are exchanging things right this kind of concept of money of just transaction and making the shift from transaction to trust is really happening mm-hmm. right at, at this level um and so uh, now in comes this young man probably at 13 he's putting name tags on the seats in comes um another maybe young girl maybe at nine she's putting like tea tea saucer in a teacup you know and then in come all the elders. So like elders of like the five great nations of, of the U.S., the, the chiefs and the chieftains and um, the shamanis of like the 26 great tribes of Canada, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So they all walk in with a regalia, right? And they're seated. And this young man says, okay, please enjoy snacks and tea. And we're waiting for other folks to join in. And in comes this like the Dalai Lama and a bunch of other personalities. And then he says, this young man, <clears throat> says, thank you for gathering here, for doing the work that we've done on this planet to raise and elevate consciousness. This weekend, we're going to celebrate all this work. And starting Sunday morning, we're going to create from nothing what it means to really prepare this space for other beings that are wanting to be born here, you know, from other galaxies. Mm-hmm. But let's begin with a prayer. And it's about 530. The sun is setting. And this young man says, oh, and I wake up. Right. So this is how vivid this vision is. Right. Um, And so, you know, I share that because I feel like the more that I've shared that with others, others also have this idea of like returning back to certain more human ways of connecting and relating. Right. Um, So I would say that that was kind of the beginning. And then the next really pivotal incident, which I was sharing with you before, was in this journey of like, who am I was during spring break of, of uh, undergrad. And I'd often do these experiments of kind of kind of break yourself down to zero and see what comes up, you know, in those harshest circumstances and situations. And I grew up, you know, I acknowledge I grew up in, in, a, in a world of privilege, you know, in a South Asian Jane family, right? My parents came here as working hard adults, you know, here and they built a whole life. And I would consider, I grew up in a world of, Privileged middle upper class New Jersey family, right? right. So, so you kind of have to, I think, you know, was I learned, you know, reading Gandhi's autobiography and a number of other folks' autobiographies is when you create and fabricate situations where you put yourself in, where you kind of simulate breaking yourself down to zero. You know, it's just a taste of it, but you try, right? Mm-hmm. 
So I remember when I first uh, summer spring break, I spent a week in Manhattan. Like as this is back when and I'm gonna date myself, but when you had pay phones, and you didn't have cell phones, you know, these little calling cards that you had to scratch off. Remember those? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I remember um, the day after like classes were over, I'm dressed in like BDU uniform. Yeah, I was in junior army program, and like grabbed my beard, and had a journal, and I had ten bucks in my wallet, and uh, you know, and, and that was it. And enough train fare to go to the city my mom's like where are you going and i said well i'm gonna be in the city for about seven days she's like who are you staying with on the street you know so I was totally you know of course freaked out right so she's like well you're gonna do what you're gonna do here's a calling card call every day at 8 p.m and I, like, I don't have a watch so she actually went, <laughs> went to see and she got me with a ten dollar watch <laughs> and then the, the experiment began and it was really wild. Um, this was the, it was not spring break. I'm sorry. It was uh, during fall, fall break, and it was September, Manhattan. You know, you're sleeping on on behind the shrubbery, and you're finding the corner to keep yourself warm. And through that experiment, um, I began to meet folks who were like subway people. You know, this was like pre Giuliani days, right? And mm -hmm. And it was interesting because a lot of my misperceptions around homelessness and around inequity and around mental disability really began to get called into question, you know? And I began to also ask myself, like, who am I? What's my role? You know, I'll give you an example. I, I would panhandle as I'd run out of money and I would wake up and maybe somebody would give me a bottle of water, which happened again later in my my third experiment in homelessness many many years later after that but but you know and i would make friends with folks who had just lost their homes um one member of the couple lost their home six months and then five months later he would lose his home and then six months later the house is sold in a foreclosure and here they are you know heating their hands on these like heating barrels you know and so their trash cans rather and it was really humbling and i probably have like 25 pages of journals that I wrote in there of kind of what is my role, you know, and, and that to keep remembering, to keep breaking myself down to zero right, in those moments. And there was privilege because I knew at a home I had to, I could go back to, I could count the, day, the days down. Right. Um, but then going days without food or without sleep, it definitely tells you who you are. <laughs> so. Yeah. So what was, you know, through that process of living on the streets for that whole week, um, what was one thing you learned? I know you mentioned a couple, but let's go dive deeper into one of the things that you learned that switched, just shifted something inside of you. You know, um, during that particular incident, it was just the kindness of people. Okay. Like in that particular incident, it was the kindness of people. Um, you know, I, you know, as I would share with people what I was doing and why I was doing it, you know, some people I would share why I was doing it. Some people I would hold like, consciously, um, but folks were just so kind, you know? And I think that when you meet people where they're at versus um, trying to expect them to meet you where you're at, you know, from a place of like entitlement, um, it doesn't work. You know, when you meet people where they're at or investigate how can I connect with this other individual, bridges get 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 created, you know, and you may you never know that person may give you the biggest support you needed in that moment. I remember the first day I had just at 10 bucks and I found this kind of dude who was med meditating with his long beard. You know, oh, okay, he's safe. And I said, hey, you hungry? So sure. Have a Chinese food. Sure. Take him Chinese food. There goes my seven bucks. I said, you know, how do you survive around here? You know, he gave me all these tips. He's like, you know, you talk to the lobby guys and maybe they'll let you sleep in the lobby and make sure you click on cardboard and take newspaper and rotate it between your layers of clothing. I was like, wow. You know, he, he knew. You know, without those tips, I don't think I would have made it. So wow. during that incident. Yeah. And then there was, a, there was another incident that happened in a later uh, time that you had mentioned. Um, where you were a consultant, but you had decided for how long was it a week that you to live on the streets again? 
It was a month, actually. A month. Yeah. <laughs> okay, a month. And you went through a couple incidences where you your ego was questioned, right? Like you had people looking at you a certain way and then you would you had to stop yourself from thinking, oh wait, hold up. So wait, I want I want you to tell me the story. I, I know I butchered, but I want you to tell me that story. No, absolutely. Thank you for reminding. Uh, yeah, it was wild. It was so the scene was here's December. It was probably 2012 or 13. I think last time I actually had like a job job. Um, and I was an analyst for a Warren Buffett company, right? And uh, they were a jewelry manufacturing company. I'm, you know, one of three analysts running the whole show. And, and then my soul was dying. I told my boss, I'm giving you two months notice. I'm done after two months. I'm going to train my replacement. I'm doing an experiment in December. Uh, don't worry about it. You know, I'll show up to work on time and I'm bouncing. So December rolled around and I lived out of Penn Station for a month. Um, and it was really wild. It was, I had two bags. I had a duffel bag with my, call it a monkey suit, but you know, a shirt and tie and all that. And then some sleeping clothes at night. I had two pairs of sleeping clothes. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to make it and just be on about five, no, it was five dollars a day. Um, and if I needed more money, I'd panhandle and see what happened. And it was really interesting, you know, this just the incident. One of the first incident you alluded to, I would be in the public restroom. You know, those of you in the New York Tri-State area, you know, the LIRR public restroom, you know, and I'd be shaving and grooming and you know, all these like, you know, folks in the South Asian community would look down and, you know, there's a financial folks, you know, and, and they'd be like, oh, Vichana, you know, it's like, oh, one of our people, you know, one of our people? Poor guy. Yeah. They'd be like that, you know, and I, and I, and I remember initially this, this kind of like this, rebelliousness of like hey do you know who i am like who are you to look at me like that right this who are you to judge me yeah like don't you know and i'm listening to this internal dialogue and it's madness right it's like wow. wow the experiment has begun you know and and it was really wild to one of the practices during that time was hold no judgments like particularly because i you know it's like my programming as a south asian is, is achieving 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 you know, and particularly like the, the, the male programming around the South Asian programming is your value is determined by what you acquire, you know, what you have, what you can produce, what you can achieve. All right. What um, position you hold. All these things, right? Um, and so we kind of lose in touch with like who we are, right? And so, um, so I'm listening to this and I said, well, let me face it. Let me journal write. So I journal wrote. And then it was interesting because after about four days, five days, Another lesson arose is, you know, I had this thought that folks were, you know, I call them, they look at you like they're, like they're crazy eyed, you know, who've been on the streets for a long time, you know, they're muttering to themselves or, you know, they're, they're erratically, they're physically erratic or and I was like, oh, you know, we stay away from them, right? Like that's, they're crazy, right? That was kind of this notion. Well, what was wild was now here I am and, you know, Folks would notice, like, who's sleeping around, who's a new guy, who's a new person. Um, and I'd wake up and somebody would give me a cardboard, like, there'd be a cardboard box, like, flattened next to me. Because that's what you sleep on to protect yourself from the cold right. floor of Penn Station. Right. This is interesting. And then I thought, well, how can I, let me think beyond myself. And you're going to have $5. How do I maximize these $5? Maybe I drink two cups of coffee and I have these $5 to do something with it. Um, so these, this jintan is happening, right? And then as I come across these fellow brothers and sisters, you know, I ask them, you know, what's your name, brother? What's your name, sister? And they would say, Sheila, Mark. Next time, hi, hi, Sheila, how are you? You know, or I had like a bottle of water. I just hand it over to, you know, have a good one, Mark, you know, and the crazy got less. Mm. got less and less and less and what i realized is the power of a name yeah. is that the trauma that people experience when you're they're invisible like imagine nobody said your name acknowledged who you are you know and you had to mutter to yourself to even have a sense of aliveness while you're teetering do i end it do i not you know like that is Deep trauma, right? They just want to be seen. They just want we, to be seen with someone. And we all do. We all do. That's, that's, that's part of being human. 
that's the thing. And now it's, and that's in front of your face, right? Like when you go to India and you see poverty, it's in front of your face. But yet here it's like so subversive because everybody wants longing and connection and wants to be seen, right? But we're, there's so much programming that like you, it's only in crisis that we come together. Why is that? <laughs> right? Yes. It's only when we feel that pain that we, uh, you know, come together and that we uh, feel each other's uh, uh, pain and longing that, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you bring up an interesting point. You talked about journaling a couple of times and, you know, through this conversation. Is that one of the tools that you've used for self-analysis? Can you tell, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how you journal and what you do with your journaling t- uh, process? Sure. I think journaling is really important. I think it's like your dialogue with yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think that however way you are about it works. You know, sometimes if there's a lot of anger or, you know, those emotions that come up, it's kind of like, oh, there's a jagged writing, you know, and if there's mm-hmm. kind of like I'm in a thought process or feeling fluid, you know, cursive writing comes out. But but I would say that um, one of the things that, I, that I've – cultivated is writing from the I voice so even in writing like I'm feeling this this is what's coming up for me right now you know and being really mindful of like they or people or the world or things like that you know and then usually at the end of it of journaling I kind of go you know what's what's next what do we do with this you know um and lately I've been writing a lot more poetry actually than just journaling um, so that's been exciting. Wow, cool. So what, what else do you write in your journals? I mean, you write your thoughts, you write your, you know, how you're feeling in the moment. Um, and then do you write this, the, the, the story that comes about? Do you write the thoughts that come about? Um, uh, what else goes along with it? Typically. Yeah. Usually, I mean, it depends on the day, but, um, I would say that I would write the, the story that comes around. What's the lesson? You know, or maybe if there's an inquiry, sometimes, you know, it's interesting. I think growing up, there was, I placed a lot of emphasis on trying to figure things out, like from my mind. And lately, it's been a really interesting practice to hold a question, even in a journal, and like close it and go to sleep mm-hmm. and let the subconscious mind do its thing. Right. Um, in a sense, and, surrendering to it. Yeah, yeah. And then I think the, the two practices that have been really powerful, um, one in the journaling piece has been gratitudes. You know, what, are, what am I grateful for today? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much to be grateful for. Again, the programming, <laughs> being a, a success-based South Asian in America, <laughs> first generation, there's a lot of emphasis on those two things you didn't do wrong and how can you improve and better and modify right versus those eight things that did get moved forward you know and so um and then i also have kind of a a goal journal so i i kind of i I, this is very interesting that you're asking this question i i kind of create the year backwards so so i look so i look at the year and i say okay a year from now and i lead some of these exercises and some of the work that i do too um is envisioning a year from now what you know, what, what does it look like? What, what would happiness look like? What would that picture look like? Um, where would I be? Who would I be there with? What's the scene? How does it feel? Um, and then kind of reverse engineering nine months, six months, three months, you know, and it's not always a perfect science that I hit those milestones, but usually, you know, I get close. On average, you get, you make it now. Very cool. Very cool. So you mentioned something about some of the work that you do. You have incorporated uh, this, uh, you know, the one year technique, the one year goal technique. Let's talk about what is the work that you do. I know you're doing some very cool and interesting stuff, stuff up in San Francisco. Let's talk about it. Can you uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Um, You know, I feel so blessed right now to be doing what I'm doing. Um, so there's three main threads, I would say, that I kind of weave through my life um, in terms of creative work. The first is um, this group, this collective, this group of friends and I have created this collect, kind of a collective of collectives, so to speak. 
Nice. Um, the working title is called the Earth Freedom Collective, but there are two to three main pillars. So one is looking at food justice mm -hmm. and that food is medicine, mm -hmm. right? So right now in California, there are thousands of pounds of food that are getting wasted. Um, just, we just partnered with an organization called Food Shift, um, which works with the Alameda Food Bank. And we now, when I say we group of us, now have access to about four to 500 pounds of fresh produce, clean, organic, fresh produce and vegetables that are contributed also partially by imperfect produce um, that we have to just gift away to those who don't have access to it, right? So what's wild is it's not just necessarily about, oh, give food to folks who can't afford it, which is kind of the conventional thought one would think behind this, but it's really more to reverse this notion that most, most, of, most folks have to work 70, 80 hours a week, right? to afford $100 to $200 worth of clean, good, organic food a week, mm -hmm. typically. If you go to Whole Foods or you go to one of these more farmers markets, what if you could mitigate that and provide access to maybe not free produce to everybody, but at least hubs where, are these, where there are these free farm stands where produce is given away, right? And anybody can come, bring an empty bag. And so this way, and I've seen with friends, there have been other friends who've been hosting uh, our Sunday free farm stands for many, many years. Um, and you've seen people who were hyper maniac workers <laughs> who <laughs> began to work a little bit less because they got entered into the community and they even started volunteering at the free farm stand, you know, but they get their fresh produce and everything for the week that's seasonal. So you're also not eating things that are out of season and getting sick. Right. Um, so that's one piece of it. And then a second piece, part of it is, we, another group of friends, uh, used to host these free vegan dinners that were provided every two weeks on a Thursday. Um, now I have, like, I love body work and I've got some training in reflexology and lately, even that part of my life has opened up tremendously. And so the middle of next month, we're going to revive these vegan dinners, but also provide like feet washing stations and the people to have that connection of touch and affection, which a lot of human beings don't have, right? In a very kind of fraternal, um, filial, loving way, right? So, so yeah, that's going to be resurrected middle of next month and a couple of other projects as well. Um, wow. So that's the first thread. And then the second thread is, um, well, I'm launching this kind of group facilitated coaching program called a, the 90 Day Game Program next month, which is something we have prototyped another facilitator and I for about two years for free for folks. Now we've got a methodology and it's wild. So this platform we're launching is called the resource space. And the premise is we all have everything we need, right? But it takes us to ignite each other, right? Mm -hmm. So you creating this beautiful space, asking me these questions is igniting my expression in a way that that wasn't there before, right? And, and vice versa, you know, and those who are tuning in, you know, and so there's, the we source space, when we source each other, our personal growth happens beyond our imagination. Right. So that group program, and don't want to bore everybody with the details, but that's launching next month. Um, yeah, so that's the second thread. And the third last thread is um, just my involvement with the Jane community. Um, I'm currently holding a position as the West Regional Coordinator for Young Jane Professionals and you know, hope to continue being part of the organization next year. And, some capacity or another and you know it's very interesting to have participated in this community for the last 10 years um, at various levels being a board member for the young janes of america then working with the parent organization for many years and, and then kind of stepping away for some years and coming back um and seeing in our generation so much capacity right that we have in our in our community in our generation we have so much capacity based on our values to provide policy making decisions, to create social change, to, you know, California is now uh, the fir first country, or sorry, first state rather, to provide plant-based meals in hospitals to seniors. You know, I mean, that's a huge breakthrough for the plant-based world that wants to reduce animal cruelty in the world, right? right. So, so there's so much that our generation has capacity for, and, you know, we have gaps that we're built, that we're filling and bridges that we're building. 
Um, and I think that's really beautiful to see kind of a grassroots emerging and all these different ways that we're building bridges um, and thinking beyond our community as well, which can be a bit insular, right? Um, so, you know, that's a really cool inquiry to be in with people who share that passion. So that's kind of the last thread that weaves through my life right now. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. So you're doing three things that are interweaved into each other and you know, interwoven into each other. I don't even know if that's the word, but where can they find you online? Well, you know, if they want to find out more about your program in the, in the path number two, where can they find the, the, that info? Yeah, it's on, um, so it's called The Resource Space, the resource dot space. Um, yeah. Right now we have a landing page, but in about a couple of days, about a week or so, a lot of other materials will be up there. Um, and then I'm on Facebook, parts of, I'm on also Instagram. Um, you know, another really cool project for people uh, just to share here is um, when I was in India for two years, I created this YouTube channel called Legacy of Love Project, where you interview grandparents and those of our former generations and capture their stories of inspiration. So, um, you know, I can share with you the, the URL for people to just upload their videos um, and capture their videos and our team can go in and edit it and we're gonna create different you know, uh, subtitles if it's in a different language. So, uh, no, yeah, should, we, where can I, uh, what, what do they search on YouTube to find that? Legacy Project. The Legacy Project, okay, Legacy Project. And I will also include a link in the description that way they have that. That's, yeah, that's an amazing idea. Cool, so people can still send their conversations with their grandparents. Uh, Absolutely. Like if, if you have a grandparent uh, close by, if anybody who's watching has a grandparent close by or you do any video recordings, they would love to capture their, what they want to, you know, what their stories of inspiration are, what they, what they would share to the next generation. Um, what get, what, what keeps them ticking this far, you know, those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. Um, and they can just upload it directly. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, there is, there's so much to learn from our grandparents. I mean, you know, if we could carry that wisdom and, you know, take it forward, I mean, there, that would be amazing. And that's a really great project. I'm so glad you started that. And I will let people know about it too. You know, anyone that I know um, who have grandparents, I let them know about it too. Uh, but Thank you so much, Parth. It was a wonderful conversation. I'm so glad I got to talk to you. I'm so glad I got to you know, learn so much. And uh, the audience also got to gain from your wisdom on the streets, literally living on the streets. Um, and uh, you know, just your challenges that you've faced and everything that you shared is, is just so valuable that um, I think people will get a different perspective from their normal day life um, in listening to this conversation. So. Bart, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you so much. You know, and I think my last is like, like just do personal experiments at whatever level puts oneself in their stretch zone and borderline, not panic zone, but, but, you know, in that realm, but that those are so important. So Varun, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here, man. And, uh, you know, I love it. And this is just something I do. Uh, this is the American sign language for love. I do love, love and abundance. And uh, yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. And uh, uh, we'll catch you very soon again. Absolutely. Uh, Thanks again, Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll talk to you guys very, very soon. Again, check me out, drvarungandhi.com. That's D-R-V-A-R-U-N-G-A-N-D-H-I.com. Talk to you guys soon. Peace.